All right. Well, here we are, first Sunday at Center Church, started out on our own, and we're trying to figure out what are we going to be as a church? What should set the, the direction? What should our heartbeat be? What's the DNA of this church? And I began wondering, huh, is there any book of the Bible that tells the story of the church starting out and the church exploding and growing to reach more people? Is there any narrative that tells the account of the church becoming the church? Huh, I don't know. Maybe the book of Acts would be worthwhile for us to take a look at. So go ahead, grab your Bible. We're going to jump into the book of Acts. And I've got, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, in, in a way, I kind of tried to avoid ending up with Acts as our first book of the Bible we studied because I figured it was just too obvious and of course we'd be there. But as our team talked, we realized nothing could match the book of Acts for what we need as a church. So from now until mid-September, we're going to be camped out in the book of Acts seeking God's direction and what he wants for us. So the book of Acts was written by a man named Luke, who also wrote the gospel of Luke. And Luke was a traveling partner of the Apostle Paul, and he conducted scores of interviews of people on the life and ministry of Jesus and the start of the church. And so Luke was a doctor who did his research. And Acts chapter 1 picks up where Luke chapter 24 ends. So Luke wrote a massive work broken up into two parts, Gospel of Luke, the life of Jesus, the book of Acts, the beginning of the church. And Luke wrote this book paid for by a man named Theophilus. And Theophilus was apparently a wealthy individual who wanted this story preserved, and he paid for the, the writing of this book. And you'll see Theophilus' name right there in verse 1. So Acts chapter 1. Verse 1, the book of Acts begins like this. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of of God. Verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So I, I love verses 4 and 5 because what's happening here is Jesus is saying to the church, You've got a job. I want you to go do this. And he's going to give this massive calling to go and spread the news of what Jesus has done. It is an unbelievably massive task. But verses 4 and 5, before they do anything, Jesus basically says, sit down and don't go anywhere. Before you go do anything, wait for the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit of God, and then you can go out and do what I've called you to. Now, we're going to get to the baptism of the Spirit of God in the weeks to come and what that actually looks like. But for today, we're going to look at verse 3. Once again, verse 3, this is what it says. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Such a simple, easy verse to gloss over and fly by, but here's what we need to see. The book of Acts starts with the resurrected, victorious Jesus walking out of that grave, and that is where we need to start as well as a church. The book of Acts begins with Jesus conquering death and the grave and Satan and sin and hell, and that is what drove the early church to move forward. The reason why they were confident, the reason why they had joy, the reason why they were compelled to move forward is because they saw Jesus walking out of that grave. So if you want to know what this church is founded on from the beginning, it is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what our confidence and our hope and our joy and our security is, it's not in us. It's not in some strategic plan. It's not in our budget. It's not in our building. It is in Jesus walking out of that grave. Amen? 
That is what will lead us and direct us and sustain us as a church. But here's the problem. We hear that announcement so much in our lives, Jesus is alive, Easter morning and any other time, and we've grown so accustomed to it that it barely even elicits a response in our hearts anymore. We hear the announcement, Jesus is alive, and it gets about as much excitement as you being told by your boss, you've got the day off from work for Labor Day, and you can stay home, no email, right? Like, you're thankful for it, you're glad you don't have to go into work on Labor Day, but you're not exactly having joy in November because you had the day off from work on Labor Day. You see, we hear the resurrection, and oftentimes, we don't respond with joy. We don't respond with confidence or passion or excitement or peace in the midst of our life. We just kind of shrug our shoulders, go, okay, that's cool, and move on with our life, completely unaware of how massively important and impactful this truth is. And what we should be responding with is joy and confidence and knowing that King Jesus will win. But oftentimes, in my life at least, that is lacking. Now, here's how I want you to think about this. If you can press rewind and go back to the devastation of World War II, just put your mind in the experience of the people from World War II and what they went through. As whole nations were devastated, as people lost their lives, as famine wrecked people's lives and nations, as there was property lost, savings gone forever, as families are torn apart, as death reigned across the world. As this went on year after year after year, there was this growing longing in people's hearts for peace to be restored. There was this desperation for the hostility to end. As people experienced the brokenness and sorrow of World War II, they were just angsty and longing for peace and resolution and for the hostility to end. And then... In Europe, as the Allied forces were marching on and taking ground against Nazi Germany, eventually the momentum shifted. But as the Allied forces marched, they discovered concentration camp after concentration camp. Young soldier after young soldier continued losing his life. Families across the world still got letters in the mail that their beloved father was lost. Their beloved son, their husband, their daddy was gone. And even though the war was shifting, there was still tragedy and sorrow. But eventually, in Europe, Nazi Germany surrendered, and what is known as V-Day was announced. Victory Day in the European theater. And there's a picture up on the screen that perfectly captures the heart of these people. The next day after V-Day was announced, you'd better believe there was no bigger headline in the world than peace. The announcement to the world on V-Day was victory against the Nazis. And you saw people pouring out together, smiling and laughing and relieved as they held up newspapers proclaiming the good news, the announcement, or as the, the Bible calls it, the gospel, the good news of peace coming. Next picture, you're going to see a shot of New York City. Once V-Day was announced, literally tens of of thousands of people poured out into the streets for mass celebrations, not for seven minutes, not for an hour. There was ongoing celebrations as people are holding up flags, and the crowd goes as far back as you can see. It's not just a thousand people right there. The crowd goes on and on as they celebrated victory and peace. Next picture, you're going to see some people beginning to dance as streamers and paper is being thrown out of apartment buildings above, people began just dancing together. And there are accounts of total strangers just dancing together in the streets after V-Day was announced. They didn't even know each other, but they had a common experience of death and sorrow. And the announcement of the good news of victory and peace led to dancing and joy in the streets. But it didn't end with V-Day in Europe. It continued on in the Pacific Theater as well. As Imperial Japan eventually surrendered, you're going to see a picture of these, of these Navy sailors celebrating up on the screen. And this is the picture of these guys hearing the news for the first time over the radio. 
And these young men look like giddy little schoolboys at the announcement that the war is over and there's peace in the world. They aren't like a little happy and then getting back to checkers and chess. They knew what was at stake. They knew what had been lost. They knew what peace meant for their lives. And they were celebrating and confident. Now, in all of these pictures, these people weren't stupid. They knew what was left. Literally, entire nations had to be rebuilt. Lives had to be put back together. But they knew that the battle had been decisively won and peace was coming completely. They knew the victory was won and they knew peace was secure, even though there was much sorrow and work to be done. And in a similar way, we need to think about the announcement of the resurrection like that. But here's the problem for so many of us. We don't really consider the implications of the biggest news in the world of the universe that Jesus has walked out of the grave. We hear that announcement and we treat it like it's an announcement of a Memorial Day sale at Kohl's and we can get clothes half off and like, good, that's fine, but it's not life-changing. We don't respond with nearly as much joy and confidence and peace as we should when we hear Jesus Christ is alive. And when I look back at my life, and I realize how little joy I have had in this area, how little victory I've known over sin, how little passion I have had, it is because I haven't really thought about the resurrection. And if we don't stop to consider this, we won't become the church we need to be. The reason why the early church continued through suffering was not because they had a charismatic leader. The reason why the church kept moving forward was not because of an amazingly strategic planning operation. The reason why the church advanced was not because of a big budget. They went forward because they knew Jesus had walked out of the grave and was completely victorious, and that is what drove them forward. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to just take a step back, and I am going to zoom out for a little bit and just give you like a 30,000-foot overview of some massively big implications of the truth that Jesus is resurrected. So I, I encourage you, take some notes, jot these down, and reflect on these later on. I, I am not going to read for you each passage. I cannot unpack each idea fully, but you would do well to reflect and pray and read through these later on on your own. So a couple big areas of the good news of the resurrection. First up is this idea that Christ's resurrection shows death has no hold on him. You guys, we do not serve a dead Savior who left us a good example. We serve a conquering Lord who walked out of the grave. Death has no claim on him. Just as if Chase Bank walked up to you and showed you my mortgage and tried to make you pay my mortgage, Chase Bank has no claim on you. For my debt. Death has no claim on Jesus. He has absolute authority over it. Second idea, what Jesus' resurrection shows us is that evil will be conquered. So fill in the blanks. Think about the worst evil in the world that you are aware of. Here's the good news. That, my friends, is not the end of the story. That will not be the end of the story for God's people. The resurrection shows us Jesus will conquer and destroy evil at the end. In 1 Corinthians 15, after Paul unpacks the implications of Jesus' resurrection, he says these words in verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 24. Then... After the resurrection, then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. After destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. I love that image of King Jesus conquering evil. Not just putting it off to the side 
but literally destroying it. And if you think the Nazis being defeated was a reason enough for joy and celebration, that is literally nothing compared to the victory that King Jesus will bring for us. Amen? Second idea. Next thing, this is good news. That Christ's resurrection secures our regeneration, our justification, and our resurrection bodies. So regeneration, think of it like this. This is the idea of your new birth in Jesus. It's like the idea of, spiritually speaking, you being born again. You getting life given from God to you as a gift. The the light switch gets flicked on, so to speak. You're, You're awake. You're alive. You see things anew. And what 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us is that Jesus' resurrection enables our regeneration and our new birth. Next up is it secures our justification. Jesus' resurrection secures our justification. And, And that word is basically this idea. Not only are you forgiven with your slate wiped clean of your sins on judgment day, but you will stand before God. If you are in Christ, you will stand before God fully and completely justified to be in right relationship with God the Father. Not simply forgiven with a blank slate, but all of the obedience and the perfect life of Jesus is credited to your account. And you are justified to be in open relationship with God the Father. Unbelievably generous. And this is what Romans 4 says to us about that resurrection. Chapter 4, verse 24 of Romans says this. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Not just for our forgiveness, but Jesus walked out of the grave to secure your justification. Third idea is that his resurrection secures our resurrection bodies. You will be made new. No more illness of any kind. Just as Jesus' body is restored, so will your body be restored. Third area of good news. Christ's resurrection leads to newness of life and perseverance and hope. What good news for our life in the practical day-to-day experience of our lives. That Jesus' resurrection shows you in Romans 6... You can experience a newness of life that is not possible through your effort or you trying harder. It's not possible through your morality or your self-discipline. But the resurrection of Jesus is what can lead you to the experience of a newness of life and a freedom. And and this especially is needed for us because far too often as Christians, we walk around with our Eyes just looking down at the dirt, ho-hum, woe is me, I can't escape this sin, I'll probably never be free, I can't do it, I can't make it, I just hope to go to heaven, and we just have this mentality that's defeatist, that we're just walking around completely unaware of the victory that is available for us. What Romans 6 verse 4 says is this, we were buried therefore with him. By baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Just as Jesus was raised to life, we too can walk in newness of life. So hear me, Christ follower. Your sin is not bigger than Jesus. Your sin is not more powerful than Jesus. Your sin does not have a decisive claim on your life. King Jesus does. Amen? Amen. And we need to stop being a paltry people, ho-hum, woe is me, not knowing the victory of King Jesus. You can walk in newness of life. Next idea. Christ's resurrection leads to perseverance and hope. 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the most amazing chapters in the whole Bible as Paul is zooming out and explaining the implications of the resurrection. And in this long chapter, he goes on and on and on about what the resurrection means for us. And then as he's wrapping up 1 Corinthians chapter 15, after a long unpacking of the resurrection, this is how Paul ends that chapter. 
Therefore, so because of everything I just said about the resurrection, because Jesus is alive, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So the resurrection of Jesus is not just some abstract theoretical idea, like you can go to heaven someday and have a new body. If you get it that Jesus is king, if it grips your heart that he walked out of that tomb, you can be, as Paul said, immovable, steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know your work is not in vain. So friends, here's the good news. The book of Acts opens up with a picture of Jesus walking out of that grave. That is what drove the early church, and that is what will drive this church. King Jesus speaking about the kingdom of God, saying, come unto me, surrender your life, realign with me, and do what I say, and I will restore you. I will give you life, I will breathe life into you, and you will be renewed. And so guys, I need to beg you to not just let this go in one ear and out the other like I did on so many Easter's growing up. But I'm asking you to go on a journey with us. I'm asking you to pray, Jesus, show me the beauty and the wonder and the hope of your victory walking out of that grave. So here's how we're going to end this morning. I'm hoping that we can one-up our fellow Americans in those pictures up on the screen from V-Day when World War II was announced. I, I am hoping we can sing loud and sing joyfully about the work of Jesus. So Jordan's going to come out, and he's going to lead us in a song of celebration about the work of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. And so I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and stand up, go ahead and join us in this moment for the good news that we don't serve a dead Savior, Amen. but we serve a conquering Lord who walked out of that tomb. So would you join me in prayer and then sing your heart out on this first day as a statement of what this church will be. Jesus, we thank you that you are victorious. We thank you that you took the hit for what we deserved and your resurrection is credited to us. Thank you that you give us what you deserve and we will be welcomed into an eternity of security and joy And no matter what happens in this life, you have us because death is not bigger than you. So come and make us your people who celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen.